Next year, we'll see the release of the third, and so we are told, final season of Star Trek Picard. I have not been a huge fan of that series so far. Season 1 had its moments. Season 2 didn't. There is, however, one good thing about the Picard series. It establishes that, at some point, the members of the command crew of Enterprise's D and E did finally go their separate ways. Hence the need for them to reunite in Picard Season 3 so that we can bid them all a fond farewell. Again, for seven full seasons of television and four feature films, the command crew of the next-gen era Enterprise stuck together and remained mostly where they started out in TNG's first episode. But it didn't have to be that way. The show is fiction. The crew only remained on the Enterprise for so long because that's what the writers made up. They could have made up something else. Something more dynamic. Maybe even something better than what we got. At least in terms of character development. Do you ever think about how things might have gone differently? What might it have been like? What if the Star Trek TNG crew had actually left the Enterprise? A couple of notes before we really get going here. First, we'll be delving into what-if territory, so I just want to make it clear that I'm not saying whatever alternate version I come up with in this video is better or would have been better than the stories we actually got. I don't know that. I'm comparing hypothetical, non-existent stories to projects that were actually produced and exist for us to see and judge. This is just a fun exercise, not an attempt to dunk on anything or anyone, with the exception, of course, of the makers of Star Trek Nemesis. Second, I want to acknowledge that my The TNG Crew Never Left the Enterprise statement is not absolute. There were changes to the main lineup throughout the TV series. Dr. Crusher was replaced by Dr. Pulaski for a season. Worf and Geordi were promoted in season two. Wesley left the show in season four. Ensign Rowe became a bridge officer and a recurring character for several episodes beginning in season five. Chief O'Brien moved to Deep Space Nine in season six, etc., etc. My premise isn't that nobody on the TNG Enterprise ever left, or that we never see any career advancement for these characters, but that things stayed the same a lot more often than they changed, and that if they had changed more, the adventures of the TNG crew might have, I don't know, packed a more powerful, creative punch? Especially once they made the jump from TV to the big screen. There was even a model that the makers of the TNG films could have followed to do just that. The six films starring the heroes of Star Trek, the original series. Sure, by the time we get to the end of the TOS era films, the main characters have mostly found their ways back to the same spots they were in during the TV series, but if you look at all six of those movies, you'll find that only one of them has all of the major characters in their original positions from the beginning. In Star Trek V, Kirk is captain, Spock is first officer slash science officer, McCoy is chief medical officer, Uhura is on communications, Scotty is in engineering, and Chekhov and Sulu are holding down the forward stations as navigator and helm officer, respectively. Every other film in the TOS movie series has at least one, and usually more than one, of the classic Trek crew initially assigned elsewhere. Star Trek The Motion Picture begins with most of the classic crew in their previously established positions, but Kirk has been promoted to Admiral and been succeeded as Captain of the Enterprise by Will Decker, and both Spock and McCoy have left Starfleet entirely. Spock is on Vulcan, about to become a Logic Eagle Scout, and McCoy has retired. Star Trek II opens with Kirk still an admiral, Spock having been promoted to captain of the Enterprise, and Chekhov reassigned to the Starship Reliant, where he's been promoted to the position of first officer. In Star Trek III, when the Enterprise, scarred from its battles with Khan in the previous film, returns to Earth, the first order of business is for the command crew to be reassigned. Scotty is made chief engineer of the Excelsior. Uhura accepts an assignment at a Starfleet facility in San Francisco. 
McCoy is placed under medical care, and of course, Spock has taken up his post on the Genesis planet, and everyone else is granted extended shore leave. Whatever they would have been doing when shore leave was over, it would not have been returning to their old jobs on the Enterprise, because Kirk informs them that Starfleet intends to decommission the Enterprise. Well, thankfully, it doesn't come to that. Star Trek IV sees everybody together and more or less in their familiar roles. This time it's the Enterprise that's gone, until the end when they get a new Enterprise. Star Trek V, I already mentioned, everyone's back in their old jobs. And then in Star Trek VI, almost everyone is still in their old jobs, except for Sulu, who has been promoted to captain and is off commanding the Excelsior. To be fair to the creators of the TNG era films, they were in a slightly different situation at the start of their film series than the creators of the TOS movies. There was a 10-year gap between the end of Star Trek the original series and the release of Star Trek the Motion Picture. On the other hand, the first movie to feature the TNG crew, Star Trek Generations, opened only about six months after the last episode of Star Trek The Next Generation originally aired. While it was acceptable and even somewhat expected to find at least a few of the classic Trek crew having moved on from the Enterprise at the start of Star Trek The Motion Picture, it would probably have felt a little jarring to start out generations with the main cast suddenly scattered, since we'd just seen them all together on the Enterprise, and it didn't seem like anyone was planning on going anywhere. So I'll spot the creators of the TNG films that first movie. Having everyone in their established spots from the beginning of Generations was totally the right move. But the ending of Generations provided the perfect opportunity to shake things up a bit starting in the next film. Generations concludes with the destruction of the Enterprise-D. The drive section explodes and the saucer section crashes on Viridian 3. The final scene between Picard and Riker in the wreckage of the ready room and bridge make it clear, just in case there was any doubt, that the ship is a total loss. Picard speculates that there will be another ship to bear the name Enterprise, but this Enterprise is definitely history. That being the case, it would have made sense, come the start of the next movie, to show at least a few of the TNG characters working somewhere other than the new Enterprise-E. For example, Starfleet has been trying to promote Riker to captain since the second season of TNG. Since the Enterprise-D is gone, why not start Riker out in the next film as the captain of his own ship? Also, since TNG establishes repeatedly that Geordi is the best chief engineer in the fleet, why not start him out in the next film as chief engineer of another ship? If you don't want to scatter the characters too widely, he could follow Riker to his new command and take over as chief engineer on whatever ship that is. Counselor Troy could transfer to a job back on Earth or on Beta Z or maybe to a Federation colony out on the frontier where the medical facilities are still being set up and are consequently understaffed, especially when it comes to mental health professionals. With those three transferred away from Picard's command, plus Worf having moved to Deep Space Nine, remember, I think Data and Dr. Crusher could stick around to join Picard on the Enterprise-E without it feeling too convenient. In fact, I would argue that having several members of the Enterprise-D command staff reassigned away from Picard following the events of Generations would not only have made sense, it would have made more sense in terms of both in-world realism and the storytelling of subsequent films. As far as in-world realism goes, Picard's crew is supposedly the finest crew in the fleet. Is it really credible that Starfleet would just let them all remain in their current jobs indefinitely? That's a lot of talent clustered in one place that I'm sure the rest of the fleet could use. And is it really credible that all of those people would want to remain where they are? even after the loss of the Enterprise. I know that part of the deal was that over the course of TNG, they had grown close and become a family, but after the events of Generations, is it realistic to assume that none of them would want a fresh start? 
none of them other than Worf, that is, who, when he joins the cast of Deep Space Nine at the start of its fourth season, is shown to be contemplating leaving Starfleet before signing on as a member of Cisco's crew. And I'm not saying that everyone should have been given the exact same character development that Worf got, but I do think it's unrealistic that apparently no one else in Picard's crew took the opportunity presented by the loss of the Enterprise D to leave the nest and spread their wings. In terms of storytelling, separating the core group of characters before the start of the movie necessitates bringing them back together at some point, which can give the story up to that point of reunion a narrative direction that doesn't feel unduly contrived and can even help to shape where the story goes and how it gets there. For example, let's not try to reinvent the wheel here, let's imagine the ways in which the first TNG movie after Generations, Star Trek First Contact, would be different if we opened with the main cast separated as I just suggested. So Picard, Data, and Dr. Crusher are on the Enterprise E, Riker and Geordi are on Riker's new ship, and Troy is on a newly established colony on the edge of Federation territory. We still want the bulk of the movie to be about our heroes going back in time to the year 2063 to prevent the Borg from stopping first contact with the Vulcans and assimilating Earth, but before we get to that point, we need to establish that some of Picard's former crew has moved on to other assignments and then get the band back together. To me, it makes sense to start with the stuff that's different. So, instead of opening with Captain Picard having a Borg nightmare, we could open with Troy on her colony. But this is a movie, and we don't want to waste time, so we don't open on a typical day for Troy on the colony. We open with the colony under attack by the Borg. It's on the edge of Federation space, relatively far from Starfleet's support. A perfect target. We see Troy and some of the others doing their best to resist the Borg assault. Borg are beaming down and assimilating people while the cube fires on the colony from orbit. Troy manages to lead a small group of people into a secure building and raise a defensive shield to give them some small measure of security, but they won't be able to hold out for long. Then, when all hope seems lost, someone near a communications panel announces that a Starfleet ship has just entered orbit above the colony. They're engaging with the Borg cube and signaling them to drop their defense shield so the ship can beam up the survivors. The survivors are reluctant because the Borg are right outside, and if they aren't beamed up immediately after dropping the shield, they're goners. Everyone turns to Troy, who is the senior officer in the room. She asks what ship it is, and the person on the comm panel says, It's the USS Lollipop! And Troy says, Drop the shield. They drop the shield and everyone gets beamed up just as the Borg storm the room. Troy and the others materialize on the transporter pad of the lollipop, and Troy sees that the transporter controls were being operated by none other than Geordi LaForge himself. They're happy to see each other, but there's no time to catch up just yet. Geordi immediately calls to the bridge and says, Captain, the last of the colony survivors are aboard. We cut to the bridge of the lollipop where Captain Riker turns to his helm officer and says, Get us the hell out of here! And that's how we establish that Troy, Riker, and Geordi are no longer under Captain Picard's command while also opening the movie with a kick-ass action scene. After the lollipop is warping away from the destroyed colony and the board cube, we can have a brief scene of Troy and Geordi arriving on the bridge. Troy and Riker have a quick reunion, maybe a little hug, and then... They're interrupted by another attack from the Borg cube, which is chasing after them. Troy says that the Borg attacked the colony out of nowhere and asks rhetorically, what could they want? Then we cut to Picard's Borg dream, as we see it in the original movie. He wakes up, but in our version, it's not the Admiral calling him, it's Data, now his first officer, calling from the bridge to alert Picard that they've just received an urgent distress call from the lollipop. So the lollipop is exchanging fire with the Borg cube, things aren't going well, the ship is taking heavy damage, Geordi warns that the warp core is about to blow. 
Captain Riker is a few seconds away from giving the abandoned ship order, but then the Enterprise arrives in the nick of time to save the day, and after a brief exchange, the Borg cube withdraws and warps away on a course back to Borg space. The lollipop is about to blow, so Picard orders the transporter rooms to beam everyone over to the Enterprise, and they manage to get everyone out before the lollipop goes pop. Captain Riker, Troy, and Geordi come to the Enterprise's bridge. Picard offers his condolences on the loss of Riker's ship. Picard asks if they know why the Borg would suddenly have attacked Troy's colony, and Data chimes in with a possible explanation. He's picking up reports of Borg attacks on outposts all along the frontier of Federation space. Then, the Enterprise's tactical officer reports a message from Starfleet Command. Another Borg cube has been detected on a direct course for Earth. All available ships are ordered to intercept. Picard tells his helm officer to get moving after that Borg cube. Data cautions that even at maximum warp, they won't reach the Borg cube until it has already entered the Terran system. Picard turns to Geordi and says, any help you could provide in engineering would be appreciated. And Geordi's like, on it, and runs to the turbo lift. From here, things more or less go the way they go in the original movie. The Enterprise catches up to the Borg cube near Earth. There's already a fleet there trying to fight it off, including Worf on the Defiant. Everybody winds up on the Enterprise, the Borg go back in time, the Enterprise follows, you know, the deal. Admittedly, starting the movie this way is less efficient than just having all the major characters already on the Enterprise from the beginning, but keep in mind that Star Trek First Contact, as it actually exists, is pretty tight. It's only an hour and 45 minutes long, and doing things the way I've just pitched would only extend that runtime by a few minutes. A few exciting, action-packed minutes. Plus, we get the added thrill of establishing that our heroes have separated and are now being drawn back together for this adventure. Now, First Contact is the best of the TNG movies. One of the best of all the Star Trek movies, so maybe screwing around with it isn't the best idea. But here's the thing. There were four movies produced featuring the TNG characters between 1994 and 2002, and until Riker finally accepts promotion to captain and leaves the Enterprise with Troy at the very end of the last one, everyone remains frozen in place, with the exception of Worf, who left for a few years to join the Deep Space Nine crew. So, maybe having a few of them leave the Enterprise at some point during that eight-year, four-film series, would have been a good idea. We could do the Riker gets promoted and takes Geordi with him to the new ship thing after First Contact and before Star Trek Insurrection, and we bring the gang back together when both Picard's Enterprise, with Worf aboard because he dropped in to say hi, since he happened to be in the neighborhood, just like in the original movie, and Riker's good ship Lollipop respond to the hostage situation on Baku, created by the malfunctioning data. Riker's ship just so happens to be close by and comes to the scene to render assistance. Small galaxy. And maybe Riker or Geordi notice something shady that the Sona are up to that Picard's crew misses that leads them to stick around in the briar patch instead of leaving after data gets fixed up. Doing Insurrection that way would require a more extensive rewrite of that one than what I pitched for First Contact. How worthwhile you consider that project to be would depend on your thoughts about Insurrection, I suppose. I've always liked it, but it's not like it couldn't have been better, you know? Speaking of Star Trek TNG movies that could have been better, Nemesis, the worst Star Trek movie ever made, and may it always be so. I really hope they don't make one even worse than this one at some point. Although they kind of already did. It was eight hours long and released in ten weekly installments on Paramount Plus earlier this year. But I digress. How might Nemesis have been improved if some of the TNG crew had actually left the Enterprise prior to the start of that film? On paper, the premise of war hero no one's ever heard of from a slave planet rises up to take control of the Romulan Empire and threaten the Federation, and oh, by the way, he's also a young clone of Picard, 
is a big enough story to justify bringing the old TNG crew back together once they've gone their separate ways. Maybe after Shinzon's coup, Starfleet orders a small fleet of ships to the edge of the neutral zone that includes both the Enterprise and Captain Riker's ship. I know the ship he eventually takes command of is called the Titan, but I'm still going with Lollipop. Doesn't that sound like a fun place to work? Or even just to visit for a while? Who would turn down a ride on Riker's Lollipop? Or how about this? Nemesis has that subplot about Data's newly discovered long-lost brother B4, and they have to go to that planet and find all of his parts. What if, instead of being scattered around one planet, the different components of B4 have been left on multiple planets? And the Enterprise has been flying from planet to planet in this one system, detecting positronic signatures, recovering android parts, and they've got almost all of them. They're only missing one. Then they get a hail from Captain Riker aboard the lollipop, and there he is on the view screen, and he says, Captain Picard, we found something you're looking for, and he holds up B4's head. Or something, I don't know. The larger point, beyond specific gags or particulars of plot, is this. Nemesis is the last TNG movie. The door was left open a crack to allow for more in the unlikely event the film was a big hit, but mostly it's intended to serve as a farewell to these characters. That being the case, what sense does it make to leave so many of those characters in more or less the same places they'd been for most of the previous 15 years? Yes, Riker and Troy did leave for the Titan, and yes, Data died, but Picard was still the captain of the Enterprise, LaForge was still the chief engineer, Worf was back doing the same job he was doing before he left for Deep Space Nine, and Dr. Crusher was still the chief medical officer. I know there's a deleted scene where it's established that Dr. Crusher leaves the Enterprise to become head of Starfleet Medical, which is the same excuse they used to explain her absence in season two. Real creative there, John. But guess what? Deleted scenes don't count. I do recognize Crusher's post-Nemesis transfer to Starfleet Medical in my action figure photo comic, Star Trek Nemeses, but that was only because I didn't have a Dr. Crusher doll when I started making that comic, so when I did get one and introduced her into the series, I wanted to explain where she had been, so I just treated that deleted scene from Nemesis as canon. Real creative there, Steve. Also, fanfic comedy photo comics don't count either. Fanfic in general doesn't count. Unless, of course, the studio pays you to write it. Anyway, since Nemesis was the last TNG movie and everybody involved with it at least had good reason to strongly suspect it was the last TNG movie when they were making it, why not at least give the story of these characters' adventures together a sense of closure by showing us that this phase of their lives is over and they're all moving on to other things? Yes, all of them, even Picard. Here's my idea. And this could have worked whether they had split up the TNG crew in earlier films like I've been pitching up to now, or kept everyone together on the Enterprise like they actually did. Near the beginning of Nemesis, we learn that Picard has been offered promotion to Admiral. And at the end of the movie, he accepts that promotion and leaves the Enterprise. I know some of you are thinking, but in Generations, Captain Kirk told him never to accept promotion. That's right. But he's going to do it anyway. And we can have a scene in Nemesis that acknowledges that advice from Kirk and lets us know that Picard and the writers of the movie haven't forgotten about it. Maybe during that scene in the ready room with Crusher and Picard, where they're looking at the photograph of young Picard, the subject can come up. Crusher can say something like, have you given any more thought to what Admiral What's-His-Face said about accepting promotion? And Picard can say, you know, years ago, someone told me to never let them promote me, because as long as I'm on the bridge of the Enterprise, I can make a difference. Beverly asks, who told you that? And Picard chuckles softly and says, someone who would know. 
But here's the thing, making a difference can take its toll on a person. And maybe there's more than one way to make a difference. So by the end of the movie, after meeting and subsequently killing his own evil clone, and witnessing the death of Data, and engaging in a space battle with Shinzon's ship where the Enterprise is seriously damaged and nearly destroyed, Picard's had the heart just taken right out of him, metaphorically speaking, and he decides it's time for a change. Between his two-decade-long tenure in command of the Stargazer and his time commanding both Enterprises, Picard has been a starship captain for over 35 years, so he accepts promotion to Admiral and prepares to move into a new phase of his life. That leaves the Enterprise without a captain. Riker is already captain of the Titan, or the Lollipop, depending. Data has been blown to smithereens, but soon-to-be Admiral Picard knows just the officer for the job. He calls in a favor at Starfleet Command and then has the privilege of personally offering the captaincy of the Enterprise to his hand-picked successor, Worf. I added the bit about Picard calling in a favor because I know there are some Star Trek nerds out there who would be like, actually, in Deep Space Nine Season 6, Episode 16, Worf fails to complete a crucial mission in order to save the life of his injured wife, Jadzia Dax, and as a result receives a permanent note in his service record, which Captain Sisko tells him will most likely prevent him from ever being given command of a starship. Well, Picard took care of it, okay, nerds? Are you satisfied? Of course, ending the movie with Worf getting promoted to Captain of the Enterprise means Worf's role in the film would have to be beefed up at least a little. We'd need to give him something important to do in the story so that it actually means something within the context of this film that he gets the big job in the end. Maybe Worf does the badass space jump from the Enterprise to the Scimitar instead of Data and kills himself a whole big pile of Remans on the way to rescuing Picard. We can get Data onto Shinzon's ship some other way, or maybe he never left the first time, and when Data uses the remote transporter thingy, he sticks it on Worf, while Worf is helping Picard up or something. And since the two of them are touching when it activates, it beams them both back to the Enterprise. I know there's a line in the original movie about how the emergency transport doohickey only works on one person, which is there to explain why Picard and Data don't use it to escape Shinzon's ship the first time they find themselves trapped there. But we can change things a bit so that Data doesn't receive the emergency transporter until after they escape from Shinzon's ship the first time, and then just cut that line. Because... Every other time someone is being beamed out, if someone else is touching them, they both get beamed. Then Data can sacrifice himself by blowing up Shinzon's ship, and we end up in basically the same place plot-wise, but Worf has played a more consequential role and shown himself to be a brave, bold, and selfless hero. Rewriting the TNG movie so that some of the core characters start out at places other than aboard the Enterprise would definitely have made them different. Like I said earlier, I think those changes would have made sense from an in-world realism and a storytelling perspective. I also think they would have made the world in which Star Trek takes place feel bigger and more authentic. I nearly always enjoy it when a film or a TV show treats its characters as though they exist beyond the boundaries of the episode I'm watching right now. In the TOS era movies, when we find Spock on Vulcan about to receive his Logic Merit Badge, or Chekhov as the first officer of the Reliant, or Sulu as the captain of the Excelsior, it creates the impression that they have lives of their own. Lives where they aren't always supporting characters in someone else's story. They don't just sit around on the Enterprise waiting for something to happen. They live and breathe like real people. It not only contributes to their characters, it broadens the setting in which they exist and the context in which the story takes place. It's a form 
of world building, and I hesitate to use that term because it's often employed as an excuse for boring writing packed with extraneous exposition that does a little or nothing to enliven flat characters or advance the plot, but that's not how I'm using it. I'm using it to refer to things that make the world of the story more interesting, that we can pick up as the story moves along. We don't find Spock on Vulcan at the start of the motion picture so we can learn a goofy new made-up word for an imaginary discipline practiced by make-pretend people. We learn all that stuff incidentally. The point of the scene is to establish Spock's current status on the cusp of purging all emotion and embracing total logic, which then sets up his character arc for the rest of the movie, which involves Spock returning to his Enterprise shipmates and realizing through their adventure with V'ger that in order to find true meaning and fulfillment, he needs both logic and emotion in his life. We don't see Chekhov as the first officer of the Reliance, so the filmmakers can show us a starship other than the Enterprise. The Reliance visit to SETI Alpha 5, which they think is SETI Alpha 6, is what gets the plot of the movie rolling. The world building is done at the service of the story. The TNG movies are a mixed bag. First Contact is outstanding. I think Insurrection is very underrated by most fans. Generations is not very good, but it has its moments, and Nemesis is pretty much just rotten. Except for the scene where Riker and Picard say goodbye. That always gets me. Although, the reason it gets me is because I've been watching Star Trek The Next Generation since it started, not because of anything the movie itself did to make me give a shit about these characters or their relationship. It's stolen valor, John. You should be ashamed. I don't know if allowing the TNG characters to move on from their assignments on the Enterprise to spread out and then come back together would have resulted in better movies than the ones we got. Maybe it wouldn't have. But I know that throughout their six films, the characters of Star Trek the original series were allowed to progress beyond their enterprise, to expand the boundaries of their world, and to grow and change at least a little bit. And I know it's a shame the characters of Star Trek The Next Generation and the fantastically talented actors who played them didn't get that same opportunity in their movies. Maybe if they had back then, the powers that be wouldn't feel it necessary to try and make it happen now. And I think that would be better for everyone involved. Because judging from that most recent trailer for Picard Season 3, it seems like they're going a bit nuts with it. Yes, I'm talking about you. <laughs> this is from an actual Star Trek show made by professionals. Talk about being paid to write fanfic. Although, I guess it's good work if you can get it. Right, John? Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm gonna let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is gonna be, but before I do that, I wanna give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Joe Conway, thanks Joe. Steven Tufts, thanks Steven. Jeff Rauner, Jeff, thanks so much. Chris, thank you Chris. Adam Klugowitz, thank you, Adam. Wade Johnson, thank you, Wade. Michael H., the Lord of the Legacy, thank you, Michael. Dan Growl, thank you, Dan. Next, new channel members. They are Travis Lundy, thank you, Travis. Wooga, thank you, Wooga. Heather Long, thank you, Heather. Lyra Fay, thank you, Lyra Fay. Simon Price, thank you, Simon. Moss Lore, thank you, Moss Lore. Noah, thank you, Noah. Kiara Ale, thank you, Kiara. Mike Steele, thank you, Mike. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Steve Shives or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls 
that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon or become a member at the five bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. If you'd rather give a one-time gift than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that by clicking the thanks button right below the video or via PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole, and Trek Reluctantly, the watch along stream Dana and I do every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. As always, links in the description. And now, to next month's Regulation Trek Actually topic. And while I didn't plan it this way, it just so happens that next month's topic makes for a nice companion to this one. I made a few jokes at the expense of Star Trek Picard in this video. You might not have noticed, they were pretty subtle. And it just so happens that a majority of my patrons and members have voted in the most recent topic poll to make next month's video Star Trek Picard related. So, regardless of your feelings on Star Trek Picard so far, whether you think it's great, or you think it's terrible, or you fall somewhere in between, I invite you to join me next month as I attempt to answer the question, Star Trek Picard Season 2, what actually went wrong? That's next month. I'll be back then and a bunch of times before then. So until the next time you see me, whenever that is, thanks for watching and take care, everybody.